No. One thing. No, no more. I know. I'm mixed up now. There's no one. Oh, I'm going to the fire.
to worship is from uh, a hymn called Abba Father. God our Father, we adore thee. We thy child, we thy children, bless thy name. Chosen in the Christ before thee, we are holy without blame. We adore thee, we adore thee, and Abba's praises we proclaim. Son eternal, we adore thee, the Lamb upon the throne on high. Lamb of God, we bow before thee, thou hast brought thy people near. We adore thee, we adore thee, Son of God, who came to die. Holy Spirit, we adore thee, Paraclete and heavenly guest. Sent from God and from the Savior, now hast led us to rest. We adore thee, we adore thee, by thy grace forever blessed. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one, we give thee praise. For the riches we inherit, heart and voice to thee we raise. We adore thee, we adore thee, thee are blessed to end the days. Amen. Let's sing of God's faithfulness, number 139.
He's faithful and he's holy. So we ask for his forgiveness and hearts that become more faithful with the years. Let's pray together and ask for God's forgiveness. For we come before you aware, mindful of our sins. And they are many. And we're sorry. This human nature, this flesh that we have is, is corrupt. And it corrupts our desires. Instead of our one desire and passion being you, it's fractured into many worldly desires. And we struggle, and we fight, and sometimes we give in, sometimes we don't. But we ask for your forgiveness and for your mercy. And we're confident when we ask these things, because there's a cross in front of us. It was at the cross that Jesus paid for all of these sins and broke the power of sin and death. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a few moments of silent prayer and reflection. saw so a, a quote this week that said, if you talk about God's love, everybody's going to like you. If you start talking about sin, then, then people aren't going to like that. Uh, I think it's a balance. We talk about God's love and God's faithfulness that is uh, faithful and true, but we also have to be honest about our sinful natures. If we're not honest about that, then there's no need, seemingly, for God. So when we talk about sin, we don't talk about it to, to, uh, to dwell on it, so to speak, but we talk about it to remind us of our need for God. Let's say these words of assurance and forgiveness together. They remind us that forgiveness comes to us, and then we share it. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. If you're withholding forgiveness from someone, eating into or it's affecting the forgiveness you receive from God. The reminder is anytime we look at someone and we say, I can't forgive them, we have to be remembering that God forgave me. That's the formula, so to speak.
I invite the children forward for a message.
be surprised. So to speak, whom will you serve? 
And that question echoes throughout the centuries all the way to here today. Whom will you serve? The question has two parts, serve and, and who. We'll do the serve part first. The serve is, it doesn't mean serve lunches or things like that. It means who will you be devoted to? Who or what will you be devoted to? And then, of course, the who is God. And Joshua, the skilled leader, the gifted leader that he was, started off by reminding everybody what God had done for them. He took you out of the house of slavery. They were slaves. They were in prison. God rescued them. And then when the Egyptians came to chase them and parted the Red Sea and saved them again, Joshua said, remember that. And then as we've entered into the promised land, all these battles that we've, in uh, many ways, miraculously won, who did that? God did. And so, then it comes the question, who will you serve? After, after all this evidence that Joshua, almost like a lawyer, is saying, here's all the evidence, what's the verdict? What's the verdict? Who will you serve? It's such an important question for us today as well. <coughs> it is very easy. You know, Joshua makes these references to all these foreign gods. Now remember, in ancient times, people prayed to gods for help with the harvest or help with um, a whole bunch of things for protection. And sometimes these gods were pieces of wood. And sometimes they were other countries or other <coughs> cultures' gods. And you think to yourself, well, we don't have that here. We don't have any totem poles out there. We don't have this other stuff. But wait. <laughs> Not as simple as that, is it? That would be easier to drive along the way and say, well, that's, that's just a totem pole. I don't need to you know, worship that. What's that going to do for me? It's just a piece of wood. But don't, don't we find ourselves serving other gods? may not be called a god, but there are plenty that we deal with on a daily basis. One of the most powerful gods that calls out to us to worship is ourselves. <laughs> ourselves. Very easy to get wrapped up in serving ourselves and taking care of ourselves and saying, I am what matters most, or I am what matters most. Other gods that we wrestle with, the god of money, anything that we see, that we think, can protect us. Anything that we think will give us good fortune. The closest I've ever seen to this was uh, in Nigeria. We were climbing up a mountain, and uh, at one part during the mountain there was a shaped piece of wood, and the, the guy that was bringing us um, said, this is, this is like a god to some of these people in these tribes on this mountain. It's a god of protection. It protects who's you know, you know, it's guarding them, so to speak. So it does exist, but we face much more formidable gods than, than uh, pieces of wood. Think of the power, think of the resistance it takes to fight against thinking, my bank account is going to secure and save me. What about other people? We make other people our gods. Sometimes parents, sometimes uh, <coughs> spouses, sometimes bosses. Now, in all respects, these people are due respect, but not worship. I have to be very careful about worshiping things and people that aren't, aren't God. You can think of many other ones that we wrestle with. And so Joshua is saying to God's people, listen, your ancestors, it's what he's saying, it's in your DNA, and frankly it's in our DNA as as human beings, in our flesh, 
to want to worship something that is immediate, to want to worship something that's, that we can get our hands on. Human nature says, if I can see it, therefore it's real. We say, God's real. Yes, I can't see him. Like Joshua said to the people, remember all these things that God had done. This morning we say, look at all the good things God has done in our lives. It's important for us to take time to remember that. It's important to stop, really stop, and say, because it's so easy to get caught up in, well, God's not helping me right now. But then we look back and we say, but there was this time, there was this time, there was this time. We sang about God being faithful. He is. Just because we don't remember it doesn't change his faithfulness. <laughs> Joshua says, remember all these times. And then he says, as we enter into this promised land, who will you serve? Your ancestors used to worship other gods. But now the decision has to be made. Now the commitment has to be made. Who will you serve? And Joshua, the good leader, the solid leader that he was, says, I don't know who you're going to serve, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So he steps up and says, me, for me and my household, we're going to serve God. Leading by example. That verse, you've probably heard that verse, 24-15, plenty of ways, and that's and it's rightly used uh, to encourage people. For me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But you've got to see the whole picture of the scripture to understand why he's saying that and why it's so important. It's in the face of these other options that they had and that we have. So Joshua does this example. He says, for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And here in Father's Day, the reason why I Selected the scriptures because speaking to fathers, but also spouses, but just anyone in general, particularly fathers today, it's up to you to choose whom your household will serve. That's leadership. I'm not saying it has to be an iron fist and you have to force everybody. But like Joshua, you need to say, in this household, we're going to serve the Lord. That's going to look different in, in various places, in various households. But the choice is yours. The decision is yours. And likewise, in other contexts as well. It's part commitment, internal, heart and soul. It's part also witness to say, Joshua saying to the people, but for us here today to say to others, our household chooses the Lord. <coughs> they don't have to have a parade. They don't have to put it in anybody's face. But we can let people know this is a household that chooses the Lord. Over, parentheses, over other gods. Over popularity. Over financial gain and material gain. Think about some of the people that you know. Think about yourselves, perhaps. What emphasis you put on material things. Again, it's not a piece of wood on a mountain. But people who accumulate cars and, and all this other stuff, that's their God. That's whom they're choosing to serve. Joshua says, but for my household, we will choose to serve the Lord. And you heard the people's response. We're going to do it too. Joshua says, now wait a minute. Just remember, if you choose this and you abandon it, there will be some serious consequences. And of course, at that, we know the rest of the story. God's people and God's people today frequently make other commitments. That's where God's grace comes in. We talked about that earlier. But I love this opportunity to make this decision, this commitment to say, but for me and my household, we will choose the Lord. And they make a covenant together. And they make that stone there, a bit of an altar. 
They say, God has heard of all this. We are witnesses among ourselves. And God is our witness. We have decided we're choosing to serve the Lord. In Deuteronomy, when we talked about this, Moses said, choose life. Choose serving the Lord. That leads to life. Joshua echoed that when he's saying, me and my household, we're choosing life. We're choosing something that's going to give life. Choosing to worship things of this world may feel great for a while, but it will not lead to, will not lead to life abundant here in the present. It will not lead to eternal life. Joshua's people say, we're going to choose the Lord for our household. Here today, in this room, we have a choice. We're invited to choose Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior. Joshua was, was hinting at that we can't just say it. That's why they do the covenant at the end. Covenant, as you know, is a commitment a relationship. It's not just a contract you do for me, I do for you. <clears throat> covenant. Especially then, a, the Hebrew word for covenant is brief. It means to tear. So he used to take something, and he used to tear it and say, here's your part, here's my part. Covenant. Joshua says, no more talk. We're committing now. Likewise with us here today, we talk a lot about God. We talk a lot about church. We talk a lot about Jesus. But at some point, the question has to be asked. Who are we serving? Are we serving ourselves? Are we serving the church? And watch this. Careful. Do we serve church above Jesus? Because that's, that's backwards. We serve Jesus and the vehicle for serving is the church. We've got to watch that. Are we serving other gods? Or are we serving the one who loved us so much that he went to the cross and died for us and rose again? As for me and my household, it's not perfect, but we're going to serve Jesus Christ. And I encourage all of you think about that commitment. I encourage you to serve in your household, whatever kind of household that is, to serve Jesus Christ, to put him first, to lift him up, to devote time and resources and heart and soul to him, and live in what could be called a promised land, where those promises that God has for you are. Choose whom you will serve today. And it's not enough to just say, well, this is a real choice. It's not an a abstention, or it's not a, maybe I'll think about it. That choice is there for each one of us. Choose whom you will serve today. Live in the land promised. Live in the freedom promised, and live in the grace promised, live in the healing that's promised, when you choose Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If there's anyone here this morning who maybe just kind of lip synced to all of this, all of these years. If when I say choose Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're not sure what that looks like or what that means, please, come talk to me. There's no need to pretend. There's no need to, to not know what that means. To make that commitment. You can do that today after worship if you like. But please do. And if you're already there, renew that this morning in your heart and in your soul. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you know our hearts are so fickle and so easily influenced by this world. And you also know that we desire security. And we desire resources. And we desire uh, to live without fear. 
In some ways, these are good things, Lord, but just like your people then and just like us today, we go searching and grasping for whatever's either closest or whatever appears to be the most plausible or powerful. And we're sorry for that. We ask for your forgiveness. But like Joshua and the people, we pray that your Holy Spirit moves in this room and in our hearts today to choose you. Maybe some of us have partially chosen. That's a good start. Maybe some of us have been scared to, to make a full commitment to Jesus Christ. We don't know what that means. Help us over that fear. Maybe some of us are just hearing this for the first time. You're going to move in our hearts to say whom we will choose. We thank you for choosing us. For choosing us to be here, to hear this word today. And for those watching, I pray that this this message and this decision means all that it is to me. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Once we have chosen uh, in our household, so to speak, who we will serve, that has to start to, or already has to affect, the way we live. The way we live. The way we treat others. Whether we're forgiving or judging. The way we use our time and resources and money. If the household we're serving belongs to Christ, then the financial resources of that house belong to him as well. He gives us what we need, and then we return to him as an acknowledgement that he supplied it and give back to him. Let's do that together this morning.
a postscript PS on that message. There, one of the God that comes to mind is the past. Sometimes we worship the past. It becomes a God. Also, especially for young people, very easy to worship things like popularity and things like that. Don't let that be your God. Take time in our worship to, to be a people of prayer, a house of prayer. And we do that by not just, um, not just uh, prayers in general, but specific prayers for people. We've watched just in the last few years, we watched God respond very visibly to the prayers we've lifted up. So we give thanks to Him. We keep devoting our, ourselves and our time to prayer. We do this uh, sharing our joys and concerns. Let's lift some up uh, this morning. Lord, several people on our minds that need your, your help physically. In other words, their health. I think of Uncle George, and Jack, and Emma, and Mary, and Mary, and Jesse. People who are ailing, people who are... Their conditions are beyond their ability. So we pray for your healing touch and your healing strength as well. But we want to celebrate a number of things as well. We want to celebrate a number of graduates here, here with us today, Tommy and Johanna, and their good work over the last four years and their exciting futures to come. We ask you to walk with them and bless them. Lord, we're giving thanks for Kevin's faithful service and, uh, and his witness as well. We give thanks for uh, both of those. We also want to lift up uh, and give thanks for the life of Margaret's cousin Kay, who passed away. And uh, pray for comfort for that family. We also want to give thanks for the life of Eleanor Yelovich, who passed away. She was a faithful woman, and uh, she was a treasure here. She was very active here in her earlier years. I would pray for comfort for the family members there as well. Lord, so much going on in our world, so much going on in our lives, it's hard to keep track, but you, Psalm 121 says, you never slumber, you never sleep. We thank you for watching over us. We thank you for your constant presence. May we turn to it uh, so often. Let us pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Close our worship with, This is my Father's world. And just remembering that, you know, speaking personally, whenever I feel overwhelmed or whenever I feel like uh, it's beyond my abilities, I remember that God is my Father. I have a human father, his name is Carter, but I have a Father in Heaven. And this is His world, and He is watching over me, and watching over all of us, and protects us, and wants good things for us. I can make a huge difference. I encourage you about that. Let's say it.
forth with the love of God, the grace, the peace of Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and one another.